Well, I'm going to start a little early because it's, yeah, we have one more minute. People could still come in, but this is only the introduction, and no one really cares about the introduction anyway. So I might as well get it out early because I have a lot to talk about. Uh, my name's Steve Rosted. I work for Red Hat. I'm the, um, ooh, I should never say I work for Red Hat. I always say Red Hat is, my, is the company that pays me to do my hobby. Um, I don't really feel like I'm employed by Red Hat. I have to kind of remind, that I'm do, remind myself that I'm doing working for Red Hat. And that's, that's why I wear a Red Hat shirt when I do these talks, basically because they are actually paying my salary. I don't have to take vacation to come here, so I figured I'll wear a shirt. I have three of these shirts, so, and I rotate through them as I go through conferences. So all these are videotaped. So if you go through all my, all my talks, it looks like I only have one shirt. Like I'm a comic stripped character that's always wearing the same exact thing. Um, but. Anyway, I work on the messaging real-time grid division, merge, MRG, at Red Hat, and I'm part of the Red Hat, um, or Red Hat, the real-time uh, part of that MRG, the R part. And I'm also the real-time stable maintainer. Uh, I also work on stuff like Ftrace. Uh, I'm the creator of that as well, and uh, a few other things in the kernel. But this talks mostly about uh, my work at the real-time side, I know it's the tracing track, but we use tracing a lot in uh, real-time. In fact, that's where Ftrace actually came from. It stemmed from a lot of the work from, um, I had code from uh, tracing way back when I was doing real-time scheduling back in college, and Ingo Molnar had the latency tracer. The two kind of merged together and became Ftrace, uh, but this is all done in development through the real-time kernel. So that's why, although this is a tracing track, real-time is very important because or actually, tracing is very important to the real time. And I have like a little, I feel here a little feedback on the mic. So I don't know if there's a little, should we load the volume or is that just bad? Okay. Um, I'm not going to sing. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows the Brady Bunch back, to, shows you my age. Uh, <laughs> but this isn't about the Brady Bunch, nor is it about a lovely lady. Uh, but it could, it was crazy. Um, what happened, so it could have been a, a comedy episode. But what happened was really, here's a story of an upset customer who were seeing lots of latencies on their own. Uh, now, what we do at uh, Red Hat is like our customers will say, I have this machine I want to work on, and they want us to verify it, saying that it's verified as a real-time uh, machine. And we had go through, we run a bunch of tests on a, the machine to verify it. And if we have, or actually what we do is we actually go to the vendor and tell the vendor, this customer wants this machine verified for real time. Here's the test suite. Go and verify it. Give us the settings that you do. Because we, we don't have the manpower at Red Hat to actually verify every single piece of hardware out there. So we ask the hardware vendors since it's in their interest because a large customer wants this machine, which means that they'll buy it from them. So they will actually do the work for us and they will evaluate. That's, what, that's our policy. We say, okay, you send it to the vendor. You verify this. Um, but it wasn't being verified, and the vendor didn't know how, why or how, and so they kind of threw it to us uh, because the customer was really pushing hard to get this verified quickly. So we started to say, okay, fine, we're going to break with procedure, and we'll look into why this isn't being verified correctly. Now, you have to understand what requires um, to have a real-time setup. A lot of people say, oh, I'll throw in a real-time OS, and I have a real-time system. No. Uh, your applications have to be defined for real-time. The hardware you run your kernel on has to be defined for real time. If any of these things break, you don't have a real time. So you'll have a non-deterministic system. I hate the word real time. I'd rather say deterministic. We want a deterministic system. And um, when one of these things, if you're not, there's three levels. You know, you have the hardware, the kernel, and the application. And if one of these is is causing issues, it's going to kill the whole system. Everything from the top down has to be correct. So we. Um, our verification software is called RTEVAL. Uh, I believe at the Embedded Linux conference back two months ago at this same location, uh, someone gave a talk about um, RT. No, that actually wasn't that. No, it couldn't have been here because I was only a Red Hat employee that thing. When was the RTEVAL? No, it was in Plumbers. Wasn't it Plumbers that, was that the, they did the talk on RTEVAL or something? I don't know. Oh, so many conferences, I get lost. So <clears throat> RTEVAL is a tool that we created. Um, well, we use other people's tools, like we use Hackbench in there. We do compiles in there. It's basically a script that runs a bunch of loads and runs something written by Thomas Kleichner called Cyclic Test, which does a, is basically a jitter test. It basically, what it does is it runs a um, bunch of threads that just go to sleep, wake up, go to sleep, wake up, go to sleep, wake up, measuring when it woke up and seeing if it actually woke up when it wanted to wake up. And it tells you the uh, jitter for if it didn't, 
you know, how far it was when it, from the time it wanted to wake up to the time it actually did wake up. The machine that we were verifying here that the customer really wanted was, um, had 40 CPUs, 40 cores. Uh, it had hyper-threading um, ability, so if you turn that on, it turned to 80 cores, but we didn't want that. So we kept it at 40 cores, um, which was, well, the customer was fine. They didn't need the 80, uh, 80 core switch. Uh, and for such a machine, we do a maximum of a 200 microsecond jitter, which is actually 150, I think, is our uh, standard that we say is a allowable jitter. When I do my stable releases for the real time, I don't allow anything more than 100 microsecond jitter. Uh, for the hardware I have, it should be no problem to do a, easily a 100 microsecond jitter. Uh, but for a 40 core CPU machine, you can expect there's going to be a lot of hardware issues that will make it really impossible to get everything to be under 100 microsecond jitter. And like I said, that's not the real time, I don't care what you throw on it, you know, when you have that complex machinery with all the inter interaction between the CPUs and all that, it's going to have, uh, there's going to be um, congestion that will ha cause latencies that you can't do on a little small embedded device. I mean, we would like less, but, you know, it's hardware. We were seeing 500 microsecond latencies on this thing. And we're like, what the heck? Um, like I said, it made us, my 500 microsecond latency, you know, that's half a millisecond. Um, a lot of people are like, that's not that big. But, you know, in our world, it's huge. It's absolutely something that's unacceptable. We can't have that. And, but also, it took a while to hit it. It wasn't something we just turned it on and ran and hit it. It took several hours of running before this would hit. Sometimes six hours, seven hours. And we're like, really? And now we're like, okay, was it our fault? Because with the 40, CPUs, 40 um, CPU processors, that means we have lots of congestion also with the kernel side. So it could be a hard, it could be something that we didn't experience. So, whoops. Uh, why did I always say, it should, it should just connect. Hello, why do I not have a... Get you out of there. So, <clears throat> you know, for obviously when we talk with the vendor, uh, we, as they were saying it was the software, we were saying it was the hardware. <laughs> so we had to actually prove, you know, that's <laughs> obviously the case. Uh, it couldn't be the app, because it was the app's problem, it was our software. So if it was the app who had the issue, so we could remove the app and, why? You know, the wire, they need to fix the wireless here. <laughs> I don't know if I say cancel, will that work? Hopefully it doesn't want to. <clears throat> so, the enemy. That's the 500 microsecond latency. What are our weapons to fight this enemy? We have function tracing. Uh, everyone, everyone familiar with function tracing? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't, don't want to go and talk about what the function tracing is. It's, uh, it's just a way to trace pretty much every single function inside the kernel. I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, latency tracers. We have latency tracers. Um, the hardware lat detector. I want to talk a little bit about that. Event tracing and trace rank K, I put it on here, but I'm not going to actually, I didn't have time in my talk. I, I have so many slides and so much information that I don't think I'll ever get to the trace rank K, which is a great tool, and we did use this for this situation, but I'm kind of condensing what I'm talking about, so I'm leaving some of the things out. But trace rank K is a great tool. It's like print K, but it writes to the ring buffer, and it can be done in any context. Unlike, like, unlike print K, where you can't do it within, you can't do a print K while holding a scheduler RQ lock, nor can you do print Ks in uh, NMIs. Trace print K you can do anywhere, NMIs anywhere. It's perfectly reentrant and safe to use in any premium situation. Maybe not in the actual, I don't know if you can use trace print K within the actual ring buffer code. That might be the only restriction. So function tracing, it's for doing it the normal way, you go to, like when you uh, mount the debugfs directory, you go to slash sys slash kernel slash debug slash tracing. And then you go to, and then you could, you'll see a file called current tracer. That's right up, oops, ah, that's right up there. And then you just echo function into that file. Function graph tracing is like function tracing, but gives you like a, uh, it records both the entry of the function and the exit of the function. And when it prints out, it shows a nice little design. I might show some demos of that later. Uh, trace command is much nicer to use. Uh, I actually, actually, I use trace command now. Basically, I don't go to the, I seldom actually go into the debugfs directory. Uh, I use trace command as my interface to ftrace. Uh, you just do trace command dash p, function graph, and it runs trace command stop, trace command extract, trace command report. Uh, this will stop the tracing. It doesn't actually, it just turns off the ring buffer. The actual tracing, the overhead is still actually running. Because um, to turn that off, it clears the ring buffer, so you don't want to do that. The extract will actually now pull everything out of the binary format and create a trace.dat file, and then the trace report will read that trace.dat file, and you can actually send that trace.dat file to anyone, 
and it uh, has all the information it needs to read for the information of that um, hardware. So basically, it keeps NDNS, 64-bit, uh, 32-bit compatibility. So you could run, you could do this on your PowerPC box, throw it to your Intel box, and it will read. It will work just fine. And I do that all the time as well. <coughs> RT eval. Here's the tool that we use. Uh, it runs Hackbench. If you're familiar with Hackbench? It's just really very. It's a high stress. It does a bunch of um, socket. Um, opens up sockets and writes to pipes and all this other stuff and stresses the CPU tremendously and the kernel itself. Uh, while we run Hackbench, we also run uh, kernel builds and we run cyclic tests. And that duration, the, that's how we uh, kick off the, we kick it off by just saying duration, you know, run it for 100, hour, 100 hours and see if it passes. Um, sometimes, like now, the reason why I brought this thing up is because it breaks and um, I'm saying when, it, when you get a latency and you have issues, we want to actually run cyclic tests. Cyclic tests is a little thing that actually is what tells you whether or not the tests pass. Everything else is just load the system as much as you want, but it should not affect cyclic tests. And when it breaks, we need a way to, okay, I just want to run the load, but I don't want to run cyclic tests. Just run the load. So that's why the only load, dash dash only load means it won't run cyclic tests. It will just put the load on the system. Then in another window, I'll open up and I'll run cyclic tests separately so I can actually debug cyclic tests and see why it's having its jitter. This is the uh, options that we ran. Dash NUMA, uh, dash, here, I'll go straight down the line. Uh, this implies dash A, dash T, dash N. Dash A means to bind each task to a CPU. So every task that it creates will be bound to a single CPU and will not migrate. Dash T means one thread per CPU. So basically, when you do this, dash A, dash T will create, if you have 40 CPUs, it will create 40 threads and bind each one to a separate CPU. Um, dash N means use nano sleep and not signals. If, this should have been the default. Dash N should have been the default because signals is extremely slow and not reliable. And everyone just runs cyclic tests and says, hey, I hit like, you know, 500 microsecond latencies, uh, 300 microsecond latency or whatever. And we say, well, do you use dash N? They say, no. And I'm like, well, do dash N because signals are just inherently uh, non-deterministic. Dash N uses actual nano sleep, uses the actual uh, HR timers inside the kernel, and it actually keeps everything correct. Dash P95, it sets the priority of all the uh, threads to, well, actually, it sets the priority of the first one to 95. Um, dash D0 will keep them all at the same intervals. Now, these two are kind of related. Dash, the reason why I said it sets the first one to 95, if you don't put dash D0, it sets the first one 95, the next one 94, 93, 92, 91, just all the way down. And then it will also, um, Dash, this is actually related to dash I is seeing sleep for only 100 microseconds. So it actually will, it will actually say go to sleep and wake up in 100 microseconds from now. And <clears throat> I know it's actually, we really stress it because we said sleep less than what we allow to be the jitter. Because <laughs> that actually makes it kind of uh, more difficult to uh, succeed. But if you don't do the uh, dash D0, uh, the first one will be 100, the next one will be 200, the next one will be 300, the next one will be 400. But D0 means, hey, keep whatever I set of these two guys, this, uh, I want all the threads to be at priority 95, and all the threads doing a 100 microsecond uh, sleep. Dash Q just means don't show the status of while it's running, and M means run mlock memory. For those that do real time, you should understand mlock call is something that's kind of important. You don't want, you know, Having stuff paged in at weird times causes uh, non-determinism. Now, for debugging it, we added dash B200. Um, so what dash B200 means, break after you hit a 200 microcentron latency. So if any time you had a jitter of over 200, stop, stop the test right there. Not only that, it also enables function tracing. If you two, it'll enable function tracing while running this. And when it hits the latency, it set, tells the tracer, ter, does the tra better trace command stop? It basically does that too. It says, stop the tracer. But function tracing, it traces every single function and can add a lot of overhead to the system. I mean, you're talking about 100% overhead to the system. Like when you run Hackbench, you get maybe two seconds on a Hackbench run. You run function tracer, you get 20 seconds on a Hackbench run. You know? So it's a magnitude sometimes greater. Uh, so sometimes what I'll do is here, I'll just increase the dash breakpoint to a large value, hoping that, or I'll run it, look at what the average is, look what, what the big things are, and then I'll just say, okay, try to do it bigger, and hopefully if I hit that large value, I hit the same case. But that, that is unreliable sometimes. So you get that, it works sometimes, sometimes it doesn't work. It's really hard to um, get that number right. So it adds too much overhead. So I've talked to Clark Williams, and he's the maintainer. Him, Clark Williams and John Kaser are the maintainers of cyclic tests. 
Now, they, it was originally created by Thomas Gleichner, but you know, Clark and um, John took it over for him as Thomas is going off on bigger and better things. And uh, so we added dash E, which instead of enabling uh, function tracing, it just enables all events. Turn on all the events, but don't turn on function tracing. This actually makes things a hell of a lot better. You don't hit the latencies, don't, the overhead is so much smaller when you enable all events. Uh, you can actually keep your normal number there and it should still work. Uh, but the thing is, you don't always get the information you want when you do hit a latency. That's the whole you know, balance that you have to make, the Heisenberg thing area. So the more information you ask from the kernel, the more likely you're changing the environment of what you're trying to debug. Um, so, one thing about function tracing and trace command is the fact that you can actually limit what functions you're going to trace. Uh, if you have dynamic ftrace running, which I don't, it, you, it would be stupid not to. Uh, I'm not going to go into that, why that's the case. But um, So trace command start dash p dash n star lock, that first thing I have up here, that basically just says don't trace any locks, which is kind of strange. I put this in the slide because actually I did the opposite. I only trace the locks. <laughs> But, um, or trace anything that starts with, has lock in it, which I found out it also won't trace clocks. <laughs> so you put a start, but like here I said, I just want to trace the schedule functions, or anything, any function that has sched, I put, you know, quote, star, sched, sched. So this is a uh, really poor man's glob expression. You can put a star at the beginning, star at the end, or star on both sides, but you can't do like sched star something. You know, it, it's very limited. This is actually written in the kernel. Uh, it's, all this thing does is writes to the set ftrace filter or the set ftrace no trace files in the debugfs directory. It's no different. Like I said, trace command is basically just a front end to the debugfs system of your kernel. So this is what we ran now. Um, you could, so after you do this, you could run cyclic tests where if you're B with, and let the function tracer go. And cyclic test doesn't know anything about the limiting of functions. So if you limit something, it won't know it. So you don't actually, your overhead will actually be much smaller when you start limiting functions and then run cyclic tests with the function tracer running. And then you actually can get some more information out of it. So what's our next thing? We have latency tracers. And I want to mention this because we did use it, but they all proved to be useless. <laughs> but um, it, it sort of helped a little bit. Uh, wake up RT. Um, I guess the uh, reason why I say ignore wake up tracer, there's a wake up tracer and there's a wake up RT tracer. Wake up tracer will find the uh, latency or how long it took from the time that a task was woken up to the time that it was actually scheduled in. And when you do it to just, if you just run the wake up tracer, that does all tasks. And usually non RT tasks take a lot longer to wake up than RT tasks. So if you're interested in why your RT task isn't waking up quickly, uh, don't run the wake up tracer because it will always it will always pick probably a task that, you know, yeah, I know that's a, you know, it's a sked other task. It was the highest priority task at the time, yet yeah, it took, you know, 500 microseconds to wake up or a millisecond to wake up, but I don't care. So there's another tracer called wakeup-rt. That's the one you want to use because it ignores anything that's not a real-time task. It has to be a real-time task and it will only measure those. Uh, the preempt IRQ is off. Uh, that's another tracer that is actually more, that's something I use. It actually does, did help a little bit. Uh, Ignore the IRQs off and the preempt off because they're basically, IRQs off just says, tells you how long interrupts are disabled. And some people are interested in that. Just tell me when, how long interrupts have been disabled. Uh, preempt off just means how long the preemption has been disabled. Well, if you turn interrupts off, preemption's disabled, but that doesn't count. It actually has the kernel saying, I'll keep interrupts on, but I'll turn off preemption. Uh, but preempt IRQs off does both. It tells you how long if preemption is off or IRQs are off. So if you do disable, if you do disable IRQs, then do preempt disable, enable IRQs, and then do a preempt um, enable, it will actually record from the time it did the disable IRQs to the preempt enable, where the other two tracers will give you when IRQs are disabled and when preemption was disabled, but not the, the combined total. So preempt IRQs off is the one I always pretty much use. So I did trace command start dash P wake up dash T. That's why, that's why you don't have to worry about debugfs directories where you use trace command. You just, yeah, just do it this way. And then, um, by the way, the new, the new trace command, if you download the latest code, I think there's a trace command show. Because right now, before that, to see the output of this trace, you, uh, you wouldn't really do the extract. You'd actually look at it by doing the cat of debug, the d debug directory, debug tracing, trace. But now there's a trace command show that actually does that for you. So you don't have to worry about debugfs at all. Um, so as I already mentioned what it is, 
Now, the problem, some of the problems are when you it, enable uh, trace command, it, or sorry, if you enable wake up tracer, it automatically enables function tracing. I've already told you that creates a high overhead and it, it makes it hard. Like, you know, when you see large traces, you don't know if it's just because of the overhead of the function tracer or was it uh, what you were looking for. And it really, you spend a lot of time wasting, or you spend, a, or you waste a lot of time trying to determine whether it was what you wanted or what, um, it's just, okay, yeah, I have overhead of the function tracer. So if you add the dash D option, it will make sure, it disables function tracing and it will run the tracer. But then it doesn't give you much information because it doesn't tell you what happened in between. It'll say, hey, I, I found my latency. Then you look and say, okay, why? And there's no information that tells you anything that, it said, yeah, it woke up late. Why? It, you don't really see it. So there's not really much information without it. Uh, but you can also do trace command start wake up dash D with the, that last one, for those I don't know if you can see down there, with dash E all, which this means enable all my events. And then, then you get a little bit more information, and that actually kind of gives you hints of where your problems are, and then you could use other things to track that down. So, but in our case, it didn't help. No, the events really didn't tell us anything in any of our tracing. And function tracing caused the latencies that were just way out, and I spent too much time saying, okay, this was overhead of function tracing and not what I was looking for, so uh, I just basically gave up on the wake up RT for this problem. So I started with the preempt IRQs off, which is uh, same thing. I did the dash E all, but it was pointing problems with our scheduler. It said, hey, your scheduler is having issues. I'm like, really? So lo the, rock, the, the RQ lock was being held for some long times. So I'm like, oh, we have problems here. So it also pointed to load balancing. And I, I always complain to Peter Zilstra because he wrote that code, and he's actually worked on to make it work better and nicer. But once it, load balancing has always been a pain for us in real time for a long time. That's where uh, you got basically, you, if you have a large 40 core box and you have a bunch of uh, pro tasks that are filling up on one CPU and you need, you know, you got to start balancing that load, you know, start moving tasks to other CPUs because you don't want, you know, 39 idle CPUs and 80 tasks on one CPU. That doesn't really help anything. Might as well have a uniprocessor system. So you need to have a way to balance that. That is a very complex process, and you've got to disable interrupts because you have to have run queue locks held, and those run queue locks cannot be held without interrupts disabled. And to do this logic, you know, there's, you have to be very careful that you don't spend too much time trying to figure out what goes where because now you're adding, every time you do that, you're adding latency. So that was right. So what, it said, ooh, load balancing is having an issue. But I later found out that that really, the load balancing was fine. There was another thing that was causing load balancing to be long. So finally I said, okay, I want to look at function graph tracing. I don't want, right now cyclic test only does function tracing, so I want to look, I want cyclic test to not start function tracing, but I want it to start function graph tracing. So I actually modified the code. It's a one-liner, and I'm going to do that here later. So, and then I ran trace command this, and I just watched, um, because with function tracing, all you see is this, this, this. So with just function tracing, I ran, you know, trace command load balance, and this says just do the load balance, and it'll, it shows you that the load balance was called, but it doesn't give you any more information. But if I add, you know, function graph tracer, it, gives me, it tells me not just that it was called, but it tells me how long it ran for. So here it ran for a microsecond, here, you know, 795 nanoseconds. Hmm, nothing big. It's all within our, what we expect it to be. And function graph tracer is actually adds a lot more overhead than function graph tracing or function, function tracing. So I expect those to be numbers that are actually a little bit exaggerated as well. So uh, then I hit a latency without ever calling load. Loan balancing wasn't even involved, and I hit the latency. I said, okay, there's an issue here. Um, you know, the preempt RT kernel converts all spin locks that are not raw spin locks into mutexes. Um, so I'm interested in raw spin locks. Let me see how many, there's a few raw spin locks in there in the kernel. So what I did was I enabled the, my tracing to only trace the raw spin lock. That's all I want. Give me all the spin locks and see how long they're held for because that will actually tell you how long each lock took to run. And, whoops. Yeah, and this is the way I got, you can't see this, but I found this. 235 microseconds to grab a spin lock. But it didn't tell me what spin lock it was. <laughs> there, now you can really see it. <laughs> so, graph versus function tracing. 
Function tracing, you could do stack tracing with. Graph tracing, you can see all of, like, the times of the trace, but you can't do a stack trace on it. I haven't implemented code to make function graph tracing to give you a back trace. So uh, you can actually tell the function tracer to give me a back trace of every function that you trace. So you could see who called it. Because that's actually right now more important. I want to know what spin lock grabbed. I know a spin lock took 200 some microseconds, but I don't know what spin lock it was. Where was it? Why was it? Who? How did it get there? Um, so I have this little problem with running, do I use function tracing, but then I don't know when the latencies are. Like if I can say, yeah, I can know this spin lock was called, but it doesn't tell me when the latency happened. Function graph tracer gives me that information. Function tracing doesn't. I may have to fix this in the future. Um, yeah. So what does it do? I want to keep function graph tracing. So what I do is I added all the events, because events have tracing. It okay, has ways of doing it. So I kind of ran both the function graph tracer with only on raw spin locks. I said, I'm only interested in the schedule, the timer, and IRQ. And I eventually found the light. Uh, long story short, I found the problem. And it wasn't a hardware problem. It was actually our problem. And it was in the pull RT tasks. What I found was you had 30 or more CPUs going into idle. And they all wanted to pull a task. Now let me explain what the, I talked about load balancing. So this is actually was load balancing, but it wasn't Peter's load balancing. It was my load balancing. I'm in charge, I'm the author of the push-pull algorithm for the real-time tasks. With uh, normal tasks, you don't want to, you're not aggressive in how you balance loads because of cache issues. You don't, when you have a bunch of tasks wake up on the CPU, you may not want to push it to another CPU because it's got its cache already there and it could run and leave real quick. It may, if you push it to another CPU, you're going to have cache problems and you're actually going to slow the system down. So, but the real-time tasks don't believe that. The real-time task says, if I wake up and there's a CPU available to run, be aggressive. Don't, don't worry about caches. Push it right there because that, that little wait will cause the latency for that task to run. So it's very aggressive. So whenever a task wakes up uh, or, and it's, there's no CPU available to run, it will just sit there and wait. And once the CPU drops its priority, it will go there. So basically you have this. You have cyclic tests running. And remember I said, we ran cyclic tests even. They're all running almost in sync. We said they're all running for 100 microseconds, or they're all sleeping, waking up, sleeping, waking up. They're pretty much in sync, perfectly, all running at the same prio, all bound to their own CPUs on all CPUs. So from 0 all the way to 40, we have cyclic tests running. Then the watchdog timer, priority 99, came in and just picked up on one of the timers. And this is, by the way, I traced all this. This is exactly what I found. Push the cyclic test, one of the cyclic tests, off a little bit. That was just enough, and then it went away. But the thing was, it brought it out of sync with everyone else. So it was just one, was one cyclic test that was no longer in sync with everyone else. Then an IRQ thread woke up that was a priority 50. It can't run anywhere because all cyclic tests are running at 90, prior 90. So it's sitting there, the IRQ thread's waiting to run now. They all go idle but one. My art. <laughs> Anyone here seen Finding Nemo? A few people. Uh, I just came back from Disney. I wanted to use clip art, but I knew that would probably um, this would be recorded. I don't know where it's going, and I don't know what the rights are to do. So I drew my own seagull. So, so that's me writing. That's my artwork. And I was just at Disney World, and as you know, the old mining seagull. And actually, I was thinking of this. Uh, this is where I got the analogy for this. And the whole thing is where Nemo's dad falls up on the. Um, uh, the, uh, what's it called, uh, the boardwalk, and a seagull flies down, and they only have one word in their vocabulary. Mine! And they all go, mine, 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 and they all jump after it. Have you ever seen seagulls on the beach? It's exactly the way they act. Well, when I said this is the pull RT test, the Finding Nemo seagull effect, they're all like, mine, 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 mine. <laughs> they all try to grab it. And to grab it, they all had to grab a spin lock to do this. And they all grabbed the spin lock at the exact same time. 39 CPUs grabbing one spin lock. Wow. That caused the last one to get in. And the first one got the task. The first one said, OK, I got him pulled over. Everyone else is just spinning and then say, oh, he's gone. Oh, he's gone. Oh, he's gone. Oh, he's gone. It's like the first seagull actually ate Nemo's dad. So that caused the latency. <laughs> um, so the solution was, instead of doing just grabbing a spin lock, because the reason why you need this is this, t this guy 
has no idea that these CPUs have gone idle. So when a CPU actually goes idle or lowers its priority and it sees that there's a real-time task waiting to run, it's got to be aggressive and say, hey, guy, and, and inform that CPU saying, I'm, I'm at a spot where you can run for. So instead of doing the, um, instead of doing the grabbing the spin lock and doing the work, all I, I changed the algorithm to do is say, send an IPI, boom. Just tell the, just wake up, just inform that CPU that a, there is a CPU that's available. They all sent the IPIs, fine. When it finally, when it gets the IPI, it says, okay, give me the most, uh, the best CPU to use, and just happened to go there. And that's how that was solved. So are we on? We found our bug, right? Tell, start the verification process, tell everyone, we're gonna have it all verified shortly. End of story, go. No. Past 12 hour run, failed for 24 hour, uh, past the 12 hour run, failed on a 24 hour run. Okay, let's start again. <laughs> this is where the hardware latency detector came in. Um, it's written by, uh, yes? Just to point out, the problem you just pointed out is known as the thundering herd problem. No, actually it's the opposite of the thundering herd problem. Okay, all right, yeah. Yeah, actually, <laughs> it's the same concept. Actually, thank you very much, because I was going to mention that. I was going to say, you've heard of the thundering herd. Thundering herd is basically, you have something, you, everyone wakes up, and you're trying, but only one could run. Here's the opposite. They all go to sleep, but there's only one guy that could go some anywhere else. The yes. So it's thundering herd CPU crowds. It's, it's similar, but backwards. Sure. That's why I didn't want to call it the thundering herd because it really kind of. Yes. Actually, no. It's actually all the real resource is the one task. The lock is with the, pre the lock, but you have to grab the lock to do. The lock is the, the problem, the implementation area, because this is still a thundering herd. We just solved the, th we, the we still allow the thundering herd to happen. We just don't use the lock to do it. Oops. So, um, hardware latency detector. What it does is it goes. It's called stop machine. Puts uh, call, has one CPU spin like crazy and does a little check and it sees it see if you know if it does it says timestamp 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 timestamp. Give me the diff, time stamp, time stamp, give me the diff, time stamp. And if the diff is ever big, that means, okay, something really weird happened if there's a uh, time stamp there. Um, so you define a period and run, because if you just let it run for like 10 minutes, the system will crash because stop machine can't run for 10 minutes because you basically lock up the whole entire system. There's things in the system that need to be done that you don't want to do. So it spins around looking for latency. And this is what the code, basic, this isn't the actual code. I kind of modified it to make it simpler and easier to read. Um, but basically, timestamp, timestamp, give me the diff, boom, and if it's greater than some threshold, record. And you know, while now is different than, is, doesn't equal the period, well, I'm typo. Uh, like I said, it's not the real code. I just kind of handwritten this, uh, go and flip. The problem, anyone see a problem with this? Anyone that, okay, we ran this for days, never caught a latency. Never saw it. Never saw any issue with hardware. Do you see a problem with this? I first looked at this code and I said, there's a big problem with this. The timestamp check takes is 20, of this loop, this is about 20% of the loop. 80% is doing the subtraction, the diff, record, the if statement going up, doing this little calculation back. So 20% of the time is here. If you have a latency that goes off, remember, I, we ran for 12 hours, no problem. 24, yes. So if you have a latency that goes off once every 15 hours, if it goes, the chances are it's going to go off here, not here. So I modified the code. I put in a little check here of the la if last to zero, then I just do a diff, you know, update last now. So now I'm also checking from now all the way up to the next temp. So I check both locations. And I call this the outer threshold. I have an outer threshold and I record it as an outer, outer loop. Sometimes you might want to give it a little bit bigger time because you, you play it a little bit and then so you can give the outer threshold a little bit different time, but you catch both sides. And this actually caught something. Um, oh, before I go, I'm going to just say, it also runs under uh, stop machine, and since stop machine is so heavy, you, the period and everything, you don't want to run stop machine all the time, so I changed it to run a thread. I said, you know, we really don't need stop machine, we're only doing it on one CPU anyway, let's just make it so run, I just want a single thread, so I got rid of the stop machine logic, I said run it on one thread, and say, hey, go, and just let this thread spin, it could spin and run longer, I mean, it could run for a long time, it actually ran for like 500 microseconds, and then off for 500 miles per second. Still have the issue where it's 50-50 chance of catching the bug, but stop machine was much less than that. Uh, it used, it actually, actually it ran yield and stuff to do that, but um, this worked. And we said, hey, we found an SMI. We found something. The hardware is actually in So we told the vendors, and they said, well, we don't believe you. 
you wrote this code, we don't use your code, uh, we'll run, so here, we'll give you our hardware detector, or latency detector. And it was a user space thing, and it did basically the same thing, it had the same bug that hardware latency, it only checked the one loop, it didn't check the outside loop. So I'm like, this is going to be useless, it's not, what it, it's not going to work for us. So I started playing around with function tracing, and you know, I did the, I did the function graph fall. Uh, I already talked about this, right? Oh, and it'll still stop on a trace, uh, it'll still stop on a latency. So I ran this. Um, yeah, I modified it to use, I already told you this. And here's the output from trace command. You got it, you understand it? It looks great, you, you can see the bug, right? <laughs> this is where um, trace command report has lots of information, detailed information, great to analyze, but too much info. You know, TMI. <laughs> Don't go there. This is where kernel shark comes in. You can see the problem here in kernel shark. No. But when I zoom in a little bit, you start seeing problems. There's a gap here among all CPUs. There's a gap here among all CPUs. There's a gap here among all CPUs. And here, and here's a bigger one, twice the size of the previous ones. I found out that, and it's kind of funny, these things are almost binarily, a binary, like our logarithmic decreasing. The first one was two micro, uh, microseconds apart, or two milliseconds, then it was one millisecond, then it was half a millisecond, a quarter of a millisecond, and boom. And eventually, I think that was two SMIs that went off back to back. One would not affect the latency because it was small enough not to be a problem. It was 100 microseconds. It was about 100 microseconds. Each of these are about 100 microseconds. But when two went back to back, that was a 200 microsecond uh, latency of the system. So, I don't know if I have time. Uh, first, I'll just say I modified. Just I'm running the real-time kernel on my laptop right now. So. Uh, I keep forgetting to do this. Yeah, this is the 3.6. Actually, it's not one of the latest kernels. I just, this is the one I actually happen to have available on my laptop at the time, so I used this. It's, one, it's, not, it's, the, latest, it's the last stable kernel release that um, Thomas Kleichner gave before I, when I, well, actually, I took over before I switched over to adding my own little stable stuff. Um, oops, I really turn off the freaking. I hate these little, I, I like the little knob like the IBM ThinkPads have. I hate the little touchpad thing because my hand, my hand just happens to sit right on top of it. Whoops. Ah! That's not what I mean. Which one is the, there we go. There, now that's gone. Um, so, LS, uh, okay, it's a module, hardware latency detector. So here, I enable it, you have account, enabled, max, sample, thread. You know what? I'm not running it yet because I just realized I wanted to do something else. Let's just do this. Let's do, uh, okay, uh, vim source. This is the uh, RT test get tree that from the air. So if I do uh, vim source cyclic test, cyclic test.c, find function, and change that to function graph. This is the ch change I did. Oops. I don't have NUMA defined on this thing. Ah, is it no? No, wait. Oh, NUMA equals zero. There it is. What the? Is it? I had this built before. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Well, I guess we got to run it as uh, there. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, I know it's bottom there. Uh, 
So when I run it here like this, it's kind of nasty because it bounces around. Uh, I didn't put the dash Q, so you see all the crap uh, on there. And when you do it this way, you have, uh, it's kind of, it's give me a, oh, because I made the thing so big. Let's see if I can shrink that down. There, that looks a little better. Uh, for those that can't really see down here, although if you see this, this tells you it's the uh, priority of 90, um, 100. This is the count. Uh, minimum latency is one, average latency is jumping around, uh, or sorry, average is about six. This is the actual latency, six. And ooh, I hit some big latencies right there. Interesting. I wonder what caused that. What? Good bin, but still it shouldn't have, uh, it shouldn't have affected it. It's a real-time task. It sure, doing that should not have changed it. Could be, but let's say, you know what, let's screw it. Let's uh, do uh, dash B. Let me do this here. Dash B, uh, let's say 100. <laughs> See what happens when you run it with dash B of 100? It finds latency right away because uh, it's running function tracing, function graph tracing. Let's do uh, a... <laughs> might sleep. Hit something where it might sleep. Uh, yeah, this is, this, by the way, this laptop has not been verified for real time. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do... 600. <laughs> yep, probably what it is. Well, yeah, it's running there. I'm trying, I'm trying to hit a latency. I don't know. It's, I, I, I won't trust those latencies. I, well, there we go. Hit one. Now, I could do... Uh, Trace can be extract. Uh, there we go. And it should give me, I wonder if there's a print there. Yes. Can you close the Yeah, I was doing that. <laughs> Here, uh, trace, because there's a trace marker file, and cyclic test will actually, when it hits the latency, it will actually tell you, it will actually write into the ftrace ring buffer telling you that it hit the latency, you know, thousands greater than my 600 latency. So I could actually now, it would happen on CPU 2, so I could do a trace command report from here, dash dash CPU 2. And maybe I could see where the latency is. There is the print. Um, it's actually kind of hard to read on here, but let's just do kernel shark. If you want to, so it's CPU two here. Well, you can see where you see something happened here. <laughs> Kernel oops. Okay, that's what the bug was. That's where the latency is. The latency was caused because of the. It actually print K disables interrupts, or the serial console. It'll actually print like there's times where I disable interrupts when you do a crash or so, or when a crash happens, a kernel oops. So you can actually see right there. It just showed me. I could see right now. Right, everyone could see that right there where this is a huge gap. And when you bring the mouse over it, it tells you right now that was a kernel oops that happened and interrupts were disabled for that time for, or disabled and that's what caused the problem. It was the actual the, uh, kernel oops that happened that caused that latency. So we solved it. Anyway, going back to um, hardware latency detector. Uh, well, I have to echo one. Now, I modified the hardware latency detector to be the thread and not to do, to do things the way I did it before, and I've got to send this upstream. The hardware latency detector go, it comes with the real-time patch right now. It's not in mainline. We're trying to get it there, but there's issues. Uh, uh, whoop, one, two. And here's where it's showing you. Now, this is the timestamp that it happened at. Um, it, the inner loop was eight, the threshold is 10, 10 microseconds, that detects. The inner loop has it, here's the closest thing, that, here's the first time the inner loop found something. The outer loop has found uh, latencies about to, of gaps. So 9, 10, that's probably correct about how long it takes to do two timestamps. But you see a jump happen. Now it could be because this is just the loops happening that way. 26, but there is SMIs actually happening on this box, but the SMIs are only about 5, 10 microseconds, which won't cause an issue for us on most of the things. So the hardware latency detector will show you that. 
and have issues there. So I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to talk about, and I don't know, I don't remember. Um, but that gives me about the time, that's about the time to wrap up. Anyway, so is there any questions? Any of this? By the way, I do want to also say we've written down at 530 of a tracing buff today, tonight, whatever, if you're going to be around, if you don't have to catch a plane or whatever and you want to talk about tracing, or if you have anything you want, any ideas you want to suggest, um, I'm going to talk about some things I plan on doing in the future. So please come by at 530 for the tracing buff. Masami and I will be there. I'm hoping Arnaldo, where are you? You're, he should be getting ready for his next talk. But um, hopefully Arnaldo and everything are there. So if you can, 530. But anyway, that, no questions? And thank you very much. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Question. Okay, I'm going to try to repeat your, since this is being recorded, I'm going to try to repeat your question for those that are actually watching this out, or will watch this later, is basically we have a gobbledygook of all these uh, tools. And you're asking, is this basically a single use case scenario for, like I showed you a single use case scenario, that this is the way you would do it. Uh, my answer is actually this is the way I pretty much do all my tracing. Actually, this, I just went through, I used one because this just happened, and it was fresh in my mind. And I went through the issues I had, some of the problems, and I want, basically I'm saying this is actually, when you have an issue, this is the way I go and do, I start with the, the real time, I start with the wake up tracers, that's why I mentioned it. I start with, and then I continue with um, uh, preempt, preempt off tracers, then I do function tracing, event tracing. This is the steps where to go through. Uh, then there's trace print K, which is the lowest level of tracing, which I didn't get into because that really, that is the most specific, but it's also the most powerful. So that's the idea, and you're right, maybe I should write this up and start adding away. Right now, it's, I got all these tools, I wrote half of them, I've worked with people who wrote others, so I'm very well expert at this, so it really needs to be start. This is my first attempt of trying to publicize what is going on. Maybe other people will have time to say, hey, I'm going to package this together, so I'm going to throw that out to you. I'm already swamped with work. If someone wants to grab these things, I'll help them interact and... Actually, this works. I want. I can't repeat everything. So. <laughs> yeah. So the, uh, the the process is super interesting, and so the uh, uh, you know the, we sort of have a collection of tools. Okay, but let's let's say to, uh, what companies often do they they want to replicate Stevens uh, throughout an organization. Um, is that something that is reasonable, or is or is or are these tools kind of like as as sort of organize as package as they can get and like it's not really reasonable to say I'm going to put together a Eclipse set of packages, uh, a TDT, the tracing. Well, I don't think it would work with Eclipse, but uh, <laughs> but that's say no, I think you could actually bundle this together. I mean, you're talking to a kernel developer and as most kernel developers are, we just like to hack. And we are not very good really at organizing great tool. I mean, we, have, we, have, we create great tools, but making it most kernel developers don't have a way of packaging it nicely for higher levels because it really comes, I always tell people this, I write code for me, not for you. So everything I do has been focused, F-Trace has been focused on me. Uh, Real-time patch has been focused on me. Uh, everything, it just has to be, happens to be useful for others. Good. Mm -hmm. And I get paid because of that. Uh, so double good. So what I'm saying is a lot of focus is I do things that work for me which actually work for others. And I try, actually do try hard to make it open to others, but I'm always not, I'm not that's not my, my talent. My talent's not to say, package this up and make this good for others. Mm -hmm. I could get the infrastructure, but if you have someone that has a talent that can do that, I think the po U.S. is it possible. I say yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks. Any other questions? Wait, how did you know it was SMI and not, I mean? We talked to the vendor. They actually found it. Okay. <laughs> Oh, he asked the question. Oh, yeah. The question was, how do I know it was SMI? We actually did point out. It happened actually every 15 hours and some odd minutes. It was periodic. We saw it. Every, and that's, that's when I came down and said, you know, this isn't a kernel thing if it's happening periodically every 15 hours and nine minutes. Every 15 hours and nine minutes. And it ended up being like the uh, memory, the ECC, the SMI that did the cleanup of uh, memory exception errors or something like that. <laughs> so that actually was, was the bug. I can't say who it was, but... I think half the people could figure it out. Go on. 
Anything else? Okay, thank you very much.